Good day. I'm going to be going over the foot and ankle examination with you. To begin with, it's very important to recap the anatomy of the foot and the ankle. One can't begin to examine anything unless you know some of the basic anatomy. To begin with the osteo osteology, the ankle joint is formed by the tibia and the fibula and the talus bone. The talus articulates with the calcaneus forming the subtalar joint. The tarsal bones include the navicular cuboid and the three cuneiforms. These form what's called the tarsal bones and the midfoot. The forefoot includes the five metatarsals and the phalanges. Remember, there are two phalanges in the hallux. The prominent bony landmarks are the navicular tuberosity, the medial malleolus, the lateral malleolus, and obviously the calcaneus, all very easily palpated under the skin. One needs to know what moves the bones, and the anterior tibial tendon is the most prominent and strongest muscle in the anterior compartment of the lower limb. That is the main dorsiflexor and inverter of the ankle. The long toe extensors, the extensor digitorum longus and the extensor hallucis longus also originate in the anterior compartment and extend the toes. In the lateral compartment, the peroneal muscle group, peroneus brevis and peroneus longus, originate in the lateral compartment and evert the hind foot or plantar flex, the first ray. The important muscles in the posterior compartment run behind the medial malleolus, the posterior tibial tendon or tibialis posterior, the flexor digitorum longus tendon, which flexes the lesser toes, and the flexor hallucis longus, which flexes the main hallux. It's important to understand the basic surface nerve distribution. The tibial nerve runs behind the medial malleolus, between the medial malleolus and the Achilles tendon, supplying sensation to the plantar aspect of the foot and the intrinsic muscles. The superficial peroneal nerve runs over the anterior part of the fibula and supplies sensation to the dorsal aspect of the foot. The deep peroneal nerve, a continuation of the peroneal nerve, supplies sensation to the medial um, first web space. And the sural nerve, sensation to the lateral border of the foot. The saphenous nerve supplies sensation to the medial arch of the foot and the medial malleolus. Remember, this is a continuation of the femoral nerve and not the sciatic nerve. The ligaments are also important to understand as they are commonly injured. The anterior talofibular ligament is the main stabilizer of the ankle joint and commonly sprained. The calcaneofibular ligament, which runs from the tip of the um, lateral malleolus to the calcaneus, is another main stabilizer and resists inversion. The syndesmosis is compiled comprised of three ligaments, the anterior inferior talar fibula, uh, in, anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament, and the interosseous ligament, and the posterior tibia fibula ligament. The medial stability is obtained with the deltoid ligament. So to begin with our examination and our pre-flight check, it's important to meet and greet the patient, make sure you know their name. Expose the patient, you must be able to see all the way from the foot to above the knee, at least the mid-thigh region. Look for any walking aids, crutches, walking sticks, etc. It's important to assess their shoes and look for orthotics and splints. Wear on the outside of the shoe may indicate that they have a malalignment or wear excessive wear on the inside of the shoe, the opposite malalignment with a flat foot. The next part of the foot examination is to assess the gait. Remember that the gait cycle is broken down into two phases, the stance phase and the swing phase. The stance phase being when the foot is on the ground and the swing phase when the foot swings. Look for any abnormal thrusting. Look for antalgic gait where the patient spends less time on their foot during the stance phase. One needs to also assess the foot progression angle and look for any neurological signs while they're walking. Common gait patterns that manifest with foot pathology, obviously antalgic gait, a marionette type gait, which is an uncoordinated gait, one often seen with neuropathies, high stepping gait, or a uh, flap 
flapping foot gait where the foot flaps onto the ground due to weakness of the anterior tibial tendon or the anterior muscle group from a common peroneal nerve palsy. A high stepping gait so that the foot can clear the ground, similar pathology. Ask the patient to walk on their heels and to walk on their toes, giving a gross general neurological examination. Ask the patient to squat and then perform a Romberg's test, walking with one foot in front of the other, will give a good indication of gross neurology. Then ask the patient to stand in front of you and look at them from the front, the back, and the side, assessing for any varus or valgus of the knees, as well as varus or valgus of the ankle and the hind foot. Look at alignment of the hind foot from behind and see if the calcaneus is in varus or valgus. The calcaneus is a good goniometer, and one can assess whether there is any malalignment from this inspection. Normal is about 3 to 5 degrees of valgus. If the heel is very turned in, then they have varus, very turned out valgus. Another common finding is a too many toe sign, where one sees that the, abduct, that the foot is very abducted and you see more than the lateral border of the fifth toe looking from behind. This is just an indication of a possible acquired flat foot. Look for the shape of the foot. Either they have a very high arch foot, being a cavus foot, or a very flat foot, being a pes planus type foot. Then the next part of the examination is to get the patient to sit down in front of you. The best is having them sit on the bed and you sit down on a chair just below them so that the foot and the ankle is just below eye level. Look for any scars, look at the skin, look for any swellings. One wants to reassess the arch of the foot at this stage and look for any abnormal abduction, supination or pronation of the foot. Look carefully at the nails for obvious fungal infections, etc. and look for any muscle wasting. It's important at this stage not to forget the plantar aspect of the foot. There are many pathologies that are often missed. Look for any corns, calluses and lesser toe deformities. Now time to get your hands on the patient and the first thing to do is to feel the pulses. Remember, a lot of patients with foot problems have vascular issues, either from diabetes or peripheral vascular disease. Check the sensation grossly, fine touch, and then proprioception. Screen any tender areas and palpate systematically over the ankle joint, the medial and lateral gutters, feel the syndesmosis, the posterior joint line, and don't forget to feel posterior and the Achilles tendon. Achilles tendon injuries are often, often missed. Over the lateral side of the ankle, feel the dome of the talus. Sometimes there are osteochondral lesions palpable with tenderness there. Feel the sinus tarsi, the gap between the tibia and the fibula, just anterior to the fibula. Palpate the peroneal tubercle, which is a prominence on the lateral wall of, wall of the calcaneus. Palpate the cuboid, the base of the fifth metatarsal and the peroneal tendon complex. Along the medial side, the medial malleolus, an easy landmark to feel, the head of the talus, the sustentaculum, which is the prominence of the calcaneus on the medial side, palpate the tarsal tunnel, which is halfway between the medial malleolus and the insertion of the Achilles tendon, and then palpate the medial navicular, navicular tuber tubercle, which is easily palpable and sometimes tender in some patients. Feel along the medial metatarsal cuneiform joint for arthritis. Sir. Then when, once the forefoot, once the midfoot has been palpated, palpate the forefoot looking specifically at each metatarsal assessing for stress fractures, deformity, etc. See if there is increased mobility through the first ray. Another common pathology is a Morton's neuroma, comma, a pinched nerve between usually the third and fourth metatarsal heads, perform a click test if there is decreased sensation in the third web space. This is done by palpating the web space and then squeezing the metatarsals together. Have a look at the metatarsal heads on the plantar aspect, palpate the distal and proximal interphalangeal joints, assessing if they are rigid or fixed deformities, if there are any. Look in between the toes at the web spaces for obvious infections or signs of pain or interdigital digital corns. Time to get the patient moving. 
always begin with active range of motion and then follow with passive range. Ask the patient to actively dorsiflex and plantiflex the ankle. Normal is 55 degrees of plantar flexion and 15 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. The subtalar joint is responsible for inversion and eversion. Inversion being turning the, the calcaneus in. The main driver of this is the posterior tibial tendon. And the eversion, turning the, the calcaneus out. The main driver of that is the peroneal muscle group. Normal is 5 degrees eversion, 10 degrees inversion. And then ask the patient to turn the toes in, turn the toes out. There's very little more dexterity in the toes that can be tested. Now important to test muscle power and tension. The posterior tibial tendon, it's important to palpate the tendon while performing this test. Get the patient to plantiflex the foot properly and then invert the foot and then ask them to hold this while you try and abduct and turn the foot outwards. This while palpating the posterior tibial tendon and feel for pain or weakness compared to the other side. The, the anterior tibial tendon is the main dorsiflexor of the ankle. Perform a resisted dorsiflexion of the ankle and palpate the tendon. There are sometimes ruptures of this tendon or weakness of the muscle group in the anterior compartment. Palpate the peroneal muscle group and ask the patient to evert or turn the heel outwards while palpating these tendons. There may be tears or tendonitis easily palpable. Remember to test the long flexors of the toes and get the patient to curl their toes. In. There are some special tests. One is the test, one of the, is the test for anterior ankle instability. The and remember the anterior talar fibular ligament is the main ankle stabilizer. This is tested using performing the draw test, as you can see in this video. Grab the tibia with one hand, hold the neck of the talus and the calcaneus with the other and pull the ankle forward with the ankle in about 30 degrees of plantar flexion. Then perform the talus tilt test with the ankle in neutral, turning the heel into varus or inversion, assessing for any increased instability or increased tilt of the talus compared to the other side. Another commonly missed injury is the, is the Achilles tendon injury or an Achilles tendon rupture. The most common, the easiest way of assessing tension in the tendon is to ask the patient to lie prone and then flex the knees and check that both the ankle joints remain at the same level. If there's a difference, there's probably loss of tension and perhaps an Achilles tendon rupture and then perform the Thompson or Simmons test. Squeezing the calf muscle group should contract the muscle causing the heel to move. If there is no movement, it's possibly an Achilles tendon rupture. Sure. Then test for the syndesmosis in instability. If there's been an external rotation injury, palpate over the syndesmosis, the gap between the tibia and the fibula, and then perform the fibula draw test illustrated on that movie on that video. And in, that's instability in the sagittal plane. Perform an external rotation test, holding the foot with one hand and the tibia with the other, and externally rotating the ankle. If there is increased movement or pain, this could be positive. And then performing a squeeze test, squeezing the fibula against the tibia. If there is pain distally over the tibia fibula articulation, this may be an indicative of a syndesmosis injury. Thank you for listening.